Hello and good evening everyone. It's good to be back. We have another interesting topic to discuss and of course we have another special guest. So I would already like to welcome here uh, Dr. Victoria Walker. Hi Dr. Victoria, how are you feeling tonight? And let me know that you can hear me loud and clear as well. I can hear you very well, Caroline. Thank you. Yes, it's lovely to be here with, with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for joining our Stronger Together initiative. And as always, let me say a few things that, of course, we are here every single day from Monday to Friday to support you, to um, answer some of your questions and, of course, uh, to give you opportunity to meet top fertility experts from various countries. Tonight, we are connected to Instituto Marquez and uh, Dr. Victoria uh, Walker. Is, she is the fertility specialist at Instituto Marquez which is located in Barcelona, Spain. And as always, you know that um, th those events have been brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners as well. So I would like to thank them for their support and their um, involvement in this uh, Strong Get Together initiative. So thank you so much for that. And as you can see, tonight's topic is definitely an interesting one. And it is, um, when is it time to turn to egg donation? And of course, Dr. Victoria will start with her presentation on this topic. And afterwards, it will be time for your questions. So as always, you can prepare the questions, you can type them in right now or later on and of course dr victoria will answer them for you and and well i guess that will be it from me and uh, i believe we can start off with the presentation dr victoria ready to begin okay thank you very much and thank Wonderful. you to everyone. thank you so much okay and thank you to everyone for joining this evening um obviously i can't see you but it's it's lovely that you're here and wanting to know a bit more about me when it might be time to turn to egg donation. So let's begin. So when you're thinking about when it might be time to go for egg donation, one of the first things you think about is your ovarian reserve. And it's really important because it doesn't always match your biological age or the way you look. So if you look at the first graph in the top right hand side of the slide, you'll see that the purple line of live births is quite steady to the age of 35. But then it starts to sort of slide down because from the age of 35, we have only 10% of the eggs that we're born with, um, only 10% are left. And both the quantity and the quality of the eggs decrease quickly after this age. And the lower graph shows how from 35 years of age, the chances of miscarriages happening increase quite rapidly. So why is it important to know this? Well, changes in society mean women wait longer to have their first child, but you, of course, want to avoid leaving it too late. Based on your understanding of your ovarian reserve, you might want to try and bring forward your maternity. You might want to vitrify your eggs or even assume that you need IVF or indeed egg donation. So the clinical, currently the clinical marker of choice is the concentration of the anti-malarian hormone, which is AMH. And this is produced by cells in the ovarian follicles. And it doesn't vary very much during the uh, menstrual cycle. However, the AMH can vary quite a lot between populations. So we did a study, I think it was back in 2017, to look at the Spanish population in particular and found a slightly different normal AMH range to non-European uh, populations. So when do you think you should start thinking um, about egg donation? So maybe you're in the group of what they sometimes call premature ovarian failure, a condition in which the menopause seems to have started much earlier, typically before the age of 40. This is where your AMH might have gone right down. And often you will have be making very few eggs if you do an IVF stimulation. Usually, though, you'll still have some periods, although the character of your periods may be changing. You may, though, be completely menopausal, and this is when the periods have totally stopped, and it's expected around the age of 50 for most women, but it can occur earlier for some. Maybe you have a diminished ovarian reserve, meaning that the eggs that you have 
are of, seem to be of poor quality. And maybe you can see this if the embryos created in your IVF cycle appear to be of poor quality. You may have a genetically transmitted, be a carrier of a, of a genetic illness that could be passed on to your child, and so you prefer to do egg donation. You may have a history of IVF failure, so it's a horrible word, failure, but it, you know, multiple cycles that haven't worked out for you, uh, especially when your doctor thinks that it might be the quality of the eggs that's the problem. In some countries where IVF is subsidized, you find patients doing sort of 15 to 20 cycles of IVF with their own eggs. And of course, there isn't a maximum number to the cy of cycles, but maybe after many cycles, it might be sensible to consider egg donation, particularly if the woman or you are near the age of 40. And of course, if you've had some kind of treatments for cancer. So when you're thinking about egg donation, you need to decide whether you want anonymous donation or non-anonymous donation. Um, and here, in fact, at Institute Marques, we can offer you both, uh, because in Ireland, you can do non-anonymous donation, and here in Barcelona, you can do anonymous donation. And if you live in Italy, I don't know if anyone's joining us from Italy, then you don't need to go to Barcelona at all for egg donation. You can just send the sperm over, we make the embryos, and then we can send them back to our center in Rome. So the choice of center for you will fit with the laws regarding egg donation in each country. For non-anonymous donation, uh, the patients can choose the donor, or can sometimes even bring a known donor. So that might be a friend or a relative, although you're not allowed to use mothers, aunts, or nieces. In this option, if a child is created, then if he doesn't already he or she doesn't already know the person, then when the child turns 18, it is possible to obtain information about the donor. In anonymous donation, however, the physician will choose the donor according to the physical and psychological characteristics of the recipient. He or she will give the uh, donor's physical traits, age and blood group to the recipients, but you won't see a photograph and a child created will never be able to know the donor, even when the child reaches the age of 18. So here we talk about anonymous egg and sperm donation, which is what avail is available in Spain. And here in Spain, female donors must be between the ages of 18 and 35. The medical team guarantees the most suitable donor for each patient, and the matching process takes into account the recipient's blood group, physical features, in particular air, not, sorry, eye, hair, and skin color, and also more recently, psychological parameters, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. The donors themselves undergo a psychological assessment and uh, medical checkups and blood tests, including their carrier type, which is a test of their chromosomes, and several tests to rule out infectious diseases, and others test to rule out the most frequent genetic mutations in the uh, European population. The donor's family, uh, medical history is also reviewed to try to make sure you don't have anyone with any genetically transmitted illnesses. Uh, here, in fact, at Institute Marques, we also have a sperm bank, and the screening that the men undertake uh, is very similar to the ones that the female donors will complete. In Spain, uh, donation is an altruistic and, and anonymous act, and only the medical team who select the donor will know his or her identity. We do have our own egg and sperm banks, many clinics will, and so we do know the donors personally, and then we choose the donor for you, and we would try to make sure that the donor closely resembles the recipient, physically and psychologically. So we choose, as I mentioned before, based on their physical characteristics, so the recipient's physical characteristics. And just in the last month, we've also started to take into account the hereditary traits of their personality. So we now ask both patients and donors to complete a personality test so we can link them up according to their temperament. 
temperaments inherited and and the character will be modulated according to the environment in which you grow up and the education you receive and together temperament and character will build what we call uh, what is called personality okay Next. so here you have a, a slide about success rates and of course success rates are really vital and make a big difference to patient choices and what you might decide to do for example just just the other day i saw a 43 year old patient who wanted to do ivf with her own eggs but when i suggested to her that based on her age alone the chance of success would be probably under 10 percent whereas with a donor it would probably be between 50 and 60 percent she and her partner decided that for them the results were the most important thing more important to them than maintaining a genetic link with a child created and so they chose to do egg donation or will do egg donation now of course that's not what everyone would choose to do when faced with the same options but results are really important in when you try to make a decision about what you should do so um, obviously here on this slide what jumps out is this lovely 91 percent success rate but be careful this is a success rate that many clinics will will put on their websites it means the success rate per cycle this is the number of embryos both fresh and frozen that a donor may create for you so it's a cumulative success rate for all the embryos created from one donation cycle. So it doesn't mean that each transfer you have will give you a 91% success rate. Um, with egg donation, you will get around a 60% success rate per transfer, but the 91% is cumulative. It's important to look at success rates to know what they are, but also to see how transparent the cl clinics are. And also it can indicate the safety of each clinic. So for example, we transfer a single embryo in 90% of our treatment cycles. And you can see that with a very low twin pregnancy rate of 5%. Um, we choose to do this because we think, well, we know that single embryo transfers avoid as many medical risks to the mother and the baby as possible, as well as avoiding the possibility of having a twin pregnancy, because twin pregnancies sound wonderful, but the reality is that they're really complicated obstetrically and complicated once they arrive too. And so this safety aspect is not a standard practice in all clinics, and it might be something you could be interested in looking at at the clinic of your choice. Transparency in our activity is also important um, when we want, so we, we want to show patients about what's happening with their embryos so they know um, and so we use the embryoscope, embryoscope incubator to allow patients to see their, their embryos in real time as they develop in the laboratory and just prior to transfer and that gives you an accurate and live report of your embryo quality. Nowadays, clinics try to differentiate themselves from other clinics by offering a certain number of guarantees, and we're no different in that respect. We now guarantee a positive pregnancy test following egg donation or a minimum of two blastocysts, so that's two day five embryos. And if either a pregnancy or two or more blastocysts are not created, then a patient will benefit from a 50% discount in the second egg donation cycle. So that's a kind of small detail, but it can be important. Here we have the next slide, which shows um, how anonymous egg donation occurs in Barcelona. So you can see that the, the donor is synchronized directly with the recipient. And this allows the recipient to go to Barcelona just once for transfer, just for transfer. The sperm sample from the partner uh, can be cryopreserved and then sent from the patient's country of residence to Barcelona. And then the female partner will complete all her preparatory tests in her own country. And then we synchronize with the donor and the embryos are created using her partner's sperm. And she can go to Barcelona for just one day to allow the embryo transfer to occur into her uterus. 
We do synchronize the menstrual cycles of the patient with the donor in order to create a, to complete a fresh transfer in the first instance with further frozen embryo transfers if needed. And this is the treatment that would offer a cumulative success rate per cycle of 91%. If a patient needs an anonymous sperm donor, either for IVF or an insemination, the same procedure happens. So the preparation and medical tests are carried out in the country of origin, or the country of residence, sorry, and it's only necessary to come to Barcelona for the last stages, uh, last scan maybe in IVF, um, and then the embryo transfer, embryo egg collection and embryo transfer. So here are the add-on techniques that we can offer, and I'll talk a little bit more about each one of them, the blastocyst culture, the use of the embryoscope, and the PGD testing. So uh, why would you want to have a blastocyst transfer? Well, first of all, what is a blastocyst transfer? A blastocyst transfer is where you wait for five days before you do the transfer. And this is... Uh, a process that we now encourage to allow us to be able to select, better select the embryos uh, for transfer because some of the embryos will just fade away whilst others will evolve really strongly. And it allows us to have better synchrony, synchronize better the embryo stage with the lining of the uterus and that in itself will hopefully improve implantation. It also allows us to transfer just one embryo, as I mentioned, we prefer to do that, to maximize the chances of success and minimize the chances of having a multiple pregnancy. So this is the embryoscope. This is a special incubator that provides the embryo with everything it needs in order to develop uh, it provides it with the right temperature, the right pH, the right light. But it also has this nifty little camera focused on each of the embryos. And that allows us to capture Im images for each embryo every, I think it's every 20 minutes, it takes one photograph. And so that allows us to film, to create a film of the beginning of life. And this is something that patients are usually cut off from. They can't normally see their own embryos evolving. And so we've developed some technology to allow patients to see their embryos from home with the embryo mobile. So here with an iPad, but uh, you can get it on your phone as well. Most importantly, watching the embryos with the camera allows them to evolve without being fiddled with. And we observe certain indicators that give, um, that tell us whether an embryo has a greater or lesser implantation potential. And then that allows the embryologist to choose the embryo for the best embryo for your transfer. And we've done quite a lot of research in this regard. But we also did a really nice study uh, quite recently where we noted that the patients who log on the most to see the embryos actually seem to do the best. They seem to have the highest success rates. So it's not something we can explain. We don't really know why this is, but we think maybe it's that patients already start to make some kind of emotional link with the images of their embryos. Uh, here we're sort of, uh, this is pre-implantation genetic testing. This is something that you might have thought about for IVF. It's principally used in IVF, but um, we do use it occasionally in egg donation as well. The main reasons for doing pre-implantation genetic testing would be to try to exclude embryos uh, with an inherited illness um, uh, or with uh, from patients who have an abnormal carrier types, so they carry abnormal chromosomes, but it can be used in recurrent miscarriages and also if there's a male factor. So that's when we might use it in egg donation um, because sometimes when you go for egg donation, you realize that that's not the whole picture. There may be some male aspect that hasn't been examined. And so you might want to do genetic testing of the embryos even though egg donation has been uh, completed. And so 
When we do PGD testing, we only use the next generation sequencing, but we do have the choice of whether we do a biopsy of the embryo on day five of embryo life, and this is currently the standard method. This would though require us to free, freeze the embryos at day five and then wait two weeks to get the result back. Um, but we do have the option of doing an embryo biopsy on day three. So a day three embryo biopsy allows us to get a result in 48 hours, and then we can do an embryo tra transfer on day five, and cryopreservation of the embryo is therefore not necessary. So we've done some research and that showed that showed that day three and day five biopsies were equally effective, and we call genetic testing of day three embryos PGD Express, and that's what that means on the slide. So today we're mainly talking about egg donation, but you may be interested to know that embryo donation also exists. This is a treatment where embryos from healthy people under 35 years of age uh, donate their remaining embryos to us after they've completed their own treatments. Uh, so conceptually, it's very similar to adopting a child because you don't have any link uh, with the gametes that created the embryo. But the recipient has a pregnancy and can rest in the knowledge that the embryo comes from healthy people, uh, generally, almost always egg donors. So this will provide the embryos themselves with a new chance of life, which is nice. And uh, it's been really enthusiastically accepted in society. So there are particular groups who are really interested to use this treatment. It would particularly be people who are looking at adoption of a child, uh, often people who have chosen not to do any uh, fertility treatment for maybe religious or ethical beliefs. Um, often women who don't have a male partner uh, and who have who are no longer able to use their own eggs, they may wish to do embryo donation to have a child. Um, we often find people with very long-term infertility problems are keen to do embryo donation, and also people who've had repeated IVF uh, failures, and also patients with recurrent miscarriages, because it's quite hard sometimes to know why that might be happening. So, uh, Oops, just waiting for that slide to come up. Uh, here we go. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes, um, even though you can do egg donation, you sometimes find that there's uh, a male factor that's affected a couple's chance of success. And so male infertility is very important. We do have our own androgy unit to look to particularly help the men. And... Um, Bringing it all up to date, um, there's quite a lot of evidence that environmental pollution can affect sperm quality, but so far there's very little evidence regarding the effect of COVID on sperm. Um, the studies that have been published in the last six months or so are usually very small samples, have very small sample sizes. So we've just set up a new study in Ireland uh, for men over the age of 18 to try and work out the, whether the quality of sperm is uh, has been affected by uh, COVID. And so we want to hear from um, men, hopefully there'll be a high participation rate, but we want to hear from men who've been in contact with the virus, who've had the disease, or even from those who've uh, not been infected. And hopefully in this way, we'll be able to compare the results and determine whether COVID has affected or can affect male fertility. Male fertility. Okay, and so now we've got a, a short video that I think Caroline's going to play for us. So here is our centre in Barcelona, which is a very light and airy space that allows patients to comfortably sit in couples or alone, and importantly today, to be socially distanced. These are the nests, we call them the nests. A lot of our first visits are completed online, often via Skype from these rooms or via WhatsApp. And we also have space for alternative therapies, such as acupuncture. 
here you'll see that there are musical notes passing up through the whole building because music is a fundamental part of our centre and even occasionally appears on our logo uh, and you'll see it here in one of the ultrasound rooms. In the ultrasound rooms the images are projected for patients onto the walls so they can easily see what's going on so there's no, no need to crane your neck. And here's a colleague showing us a blastocyst with the blob at the bottom that will become an embryo in the fetus. Here's the side we don't see, this is the entrance to the IVF labs, but the patients do have uh, a window that they can come and look, at, look through uh, to watch the embryologists at work. This is the embryoscope that I mentioned earlier, which is the amazing incubator that allows us to monitor the embryos for five days whilst they're with us in the lab without having to take the embryos out. And which you can then watch on your phone from home. I love this image, it's the moment of insemination of tiny weeny sperm into the mass of the egg. And then the embryologists will watch the embryos grow into, into multiple cells. And if you look at their head covering, you can see the music that's everywhere through Institute Marquez here. They're putting an iPod into one of the incubators because we play music to the embryos. We found that it improves the fertilization rate. Here you've got uh, some trees. And this refers to the uh, embryo forest that we have created. We are running a reforestation project with an NGO, planting a tree for every child born from our treatments here, planting the thousandth uh, child born from an embryo, planting a tree for the thousandth child born from an embryo. And here, once again, back to the music. Uh, this is Sharon Paul from the Pause and her Spanish. Uh, artists singing from a different concert for the embryos. And so, thank you very much for your time. Sorry, hope you can hear me. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Walker, for that very interesting uh, presentation, for all the explanation, of course, that lovely just showed to us and for the comments. Thank you so much for that. And so, e, I do see that some of you were not able to see the video. I can only apologize for that. I hope that uh, the rest of you was able to see it. And I just want to mention that don't worry, of course, remember it has been recorded. Therefore, it will be available on our site tomorrow. In a minute, I will simply send you also uh, the access to the YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, so you will have a chance to, to be able to see it, I'm sure. And of course, right now it is time for our q a session so um well dr walker are you ready to see the question yes uh, let's let's start wonderful happy to hear this and there are some of the questions ready and uh, let me just remind everyone that if you would like to ask anything this is your time go ahead and type the questions in the chat section and the very first question that we have is right here i am going for treatment at instituto bernabeu alicante for egg donation for my first frozen embryo transfer next week do you have any advice oh well uh hello Mundef. um well, I wish you well. I mean, that's very exciting. Um, uh, I'm sure you will have taken the medication that they have recommended for you. Um, when you see them, you can ask them whether your embryo looks good. It's a, f a frozen embryo transfer, so ask them, has it defrosted well? Um, Oh, it's a fresh transfer, not a frozen embryo transfer. Okay. Well, ask them everything that you haven't asked so far. Have you, do you know about your donor? Um, you're not going to be able to see a photograph, but have you got all the information that you want 
about um, the donor? Have you got all the information that you want about the medication? Do you know how to take the medication? Um, because you do need to continue medication if you're successful usually. Um, so just ask everything, ask all the treatments, uh, all, the, all the things that you have in your mind. Make sure you've had a time to ask the questions that you have. And excellent. Thank you so much for your very first question. And of course, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for your recommendations, your advice as well. And next question we also have, is it better to transfer to embryos after PGS or just one? Uh, hi, Claire. Um, we would strongly recommend transferring just one. Um, you may be feeling that you want, you know, two, you've been trying this for so long, let's put two back, it'll increase my chances of success. But in most clinics now, I don't believe that two embryos really significantly increases your chances of success following egg donation. And particularly when you know that both embryos are, are normal, it's, um, it's sort of, it may push your chance of success more towards, uh, let's say with us, it may maybe push it towards 60% rather than 50%, but it won't double it. But what it will give you is a 20 to 30% chance of having twins. And we don't feel that having twins is necessarily a good idea. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, twins are really complicated to look after obstetrically. So when you're pregnant with them, even if you're slim and healthy and still young yourself, um, they are complicated to look after. They often arrive early. The babies are often very small. So we would recommend that you do your preg take your pregnancies and have them one by one and have healthy children sequentially rather than several together. Thank you for your question. And thank you indeed for your question and your advice on that. And actually, um, next question is, uh, well, let me just go to straight away. Uh, yeah, here it is, sorry. Uh, is it a policy at your clinic to transfer only one? What if the patient wants to embryo transferred? Is it possible? Mm -hmm. So thank you for your question. Um, at our, at our clinic, yes, it is pretty much a, a policy for all women over the age of 44 to have a single em embryo transfer. And we recommend it for all other patients younger than 44, just as good practice. Um, but occasionally we do have patients who really, really want to transfer to. So then it's a question of explaining to them why we think one would be better. But if they still uh, believe that two is, is what they want, then we uh, ask them to provide a letter from the doctor who will be looking after them when they go back home to make sure that their doctor is happy for them to have two embryos transferred and will be willing to look after them in their pregnancy, whether they have a singleton or a twin pregnancy. And that's really just to make sure that when they go back home, they will have a safe pregnancy, even if it's a twin pregnancy. Okay, thank you for Wonderful. your question. Thank you so much for that one as well. And of course, there's a thank you from the patient for you uh, right here as well. Okay. All right, next question is also ready. So uh, as it is a donor bank, does the one donor donate eggs to multiple multiple women? Uh, so uh, we do have a donor egg bank, but we principally uh, stimulate donors to receive, so one donor for one recipient. So it's, um, that's the way our system is set up. And occasionally we can freeze some eggs, but usually it's it's one-to-one -one with a fresh stimulation and a fresh transfer. Um, and so when we're doing egg donation, we don't really, it's not like IVF. Um, when you're doing IVF, you will tolerate 
very high doses of medication. You'll tolerate side effects. You'll tolerate feeling really uncomfortable. And you'll do that because you want this big carrot of having a child of your own from your own gametes. Egg donors aren't like that. They are young women. They're generous women, but they don't want to feel unwell. They don't want to feel sick with the medication. They don't want to feel really bloated or anything. So we don't give them the same kind of doses of medication. So in principle, it is one stimulation for one recipient um, because we don't use such high doses. Some people say to me, why don't the donors produce like 20 eggs every time? Because we don't use the same kind of doses that we might use for you in your IVF. Um, but having said that, some of the donors are very young. Some of the donors are extremely sensitive to the medication we give them. So even when we give them very low doses, they might you know, respond and produce loads of eggs like a kind of popcorn machine. And if that's the case, then occasionally we would mm, accept all their eggs and give them to two donors, uh, to two recipients, sorry. Um, but it doesn't happen very often and the system isn't set up for that. All right, again, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And actually, there is a follow up, okay? Um, okay. From Karen, so can the donor do this multiple times for multiple clinics? So, Karen, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, a donor can donate to one clinic on several occasions, and she can donate to several clinics. Um, in Spain, there is a law that stops uh, that. I think the law might be changing, but currently the law states that the donor is not allowed to create more than six live births in Spain. But to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any limit any in, in international law. So um, we do monitor that this. Uh, this is really important. And we would generally not allow a donor to create more than maybe 10 live births in the entire world and we do monitor where the donor's eggs are going so sometimes you'll see that a donor can't be used in a particular country um, so that's that's with regard to how many times a donor can donate let's say in our our clinic but when we see a donor we do ask her if she has donated elsewhere and if she has donated elsewhere then we'll ring the clinic and find out what the results were of her previous donations. And so if we can see maybe she's created two pregnancies in another clinic, then we'll only make allow her to make maybe three, four more with us as a maximum. So then it's being monitored. It's something that people are very aware of and uh, because you don't want to create loads of pregnancies from just one person. Thank you for your question, Karen. Indeed, very interesting. So thanks a lot for that uh, question, of course, as well as your help and explanation. And of course, there's a thank you from Karen as well. Um, next question also uh, right here. Are the medical tests for the patient the same as those for IVF or different? Hmm. Um, well, a lot of them are quite similar. We, uh, You know, you're going to need to do your HIV tests, hepatitis B, C, syphilis, that kind of thing. Um, we'll usually want to know that you've got normal thyroid function. We'll want to know maybe your vitamin D levels. Um, we generally want to know your uh, blood group. That's something that might not have been done before, and that's used because it's part of the matching process. So that's different. Um, and then we, we'd need an ultrasound, which you'll have had millions of in your IVF. Um, but we're not looking at this in our, um, sorry, in the ultrasounds, we're looking uh, at the uterus more than the uh, ovarian reserve. And we'll be interested to know if you've had hysteroscopies, whether you've had endometrial biopsies, um, just to make sure that we think that you can implant embryos well and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of overlap. There isn't really anything that's totally different, except maybe just the egg, the the um, the blood group. That's something that's not usually tested in, in IVF. And thanks a million thanks. for yet another question. Of course, your help with this. Next question is up 
I have had a natural pregnancy and birth using my own eggs at 42. I'm now 46 and can't get pregnant or have a miscarriage. Is egg donation the only way to progress now? Mm. Well, you were very lucky to have a pregnancy. So, Claire, you, you were very lucky to have a pregnancy at 42. Um, I have many IVF patients who'd be really delighted to have a pregnancy at 42. Um, but at 46, mm, it's really, really rare to fall pregnant with your own eggs, naturally or in IVF at 46. Um, the only way is if you've frozen eggs when you were much younger and then use them when you're 46. That's a possibility. But if I'm assuming from your question that you haven't done that. Um, so, yes, I would say that egg donation is probably the main way. You can carry on trying. No harm in continuing to try naturally. And you may be lucky. Um, you evidently had a good ovarian reserve for a long time. But realistically, your chances of success will lie with egg donation in the future, I would say. I'm sorry if that's not what you wanted to hear, but I think it is probably where, where success would lie for you. All right. Thank you so much for that, of course. Um, and of course, there's a bless you thanks from Claire for you as well. Um, all right. Thank you so much. And let's have a look. Of course, there are more questions coming up. So what damage can be caused by taking the embryos out to view where embryoscope is not available? Karen, that's an interesting question. Um, so if you're not using an embryoscope, then you just use the standard incubators, which were, of course, fabulous until the embryoscope uh, was invented. Um, so uh, we've actually got, uh, my boss did a, did a blog about that. And essentially, the laboratory, when you look at laboratories, you can look back at the video, they're quite dark places. And they're quite, um, the temperature is quite, uh, is, is a body temperature. And uh, they are really strict about the staff and what they can wear in terms of perfume and things like that. And they've got, you know, triple filtration of the air that comes in from the outside. So um, although in traditional incubators, what you do is you put them in and then take the embryo out after 24 hours and put them under a microscope to have a look at them, um, in theory, they're not going to be negatively affected by that movement. And um, because we do try to control the environment of the laboratory very closely. But in, ideally, you wouldn't fiddle with them. If you imagine what an embryo is doing uh, in the body, it's in a very, it is moving all the time as it comes down the fallopian tube and into the uterus, but it's it's being exposed to just very constant body temperatures and things like that. So that's what we're trying to reflect and trying to do in the lab, but it's, I think, probably done better in the embryoscope itself. But the embryologists are very, very careful. They really are. Um, so they try to make things go as perfectly as possible if you don't use an, an embryoscope or one isn't available for you. Thank you for your question. Perfect. And thank you for that as well. And one more thank you from Karen. And let's have a look, of course, at the um, next question that we do have right here. I am 40, my hubby, and I can't make an embryo. They fertilize, okay, but do not make it to day five. Or should I consider egg donation? My fragmentation, never been pregnant. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're 40, a donor will probably give you a higher success rate just because she'll be under 35 and it's you know a question of age but from what you're telling me there may be something else going on it may be to do with your eggs but it may be to do with your husband's sperm mild fragmentation is is something that you can sometimes work on you can take supplements to try and improve it but even there are other sort of slightly more profound abnormalities that could occur in the sperm and that's sometimes seen when the embryo sort of 
conk out on about day three and, and just can't get any further. Um, and so I would suggest that, yes, you might want to consider egg donation, but you also might want to try and work on the fragmentation and try uh, and bring that down. And you may want to try and do IVF with um, genetic analysis of the embryos to try and see if you can create a genetically normal embryo. And if you can't, then that might help you to see that egg donation is the way forward for you. Um, if you've had a very long history of infertility, I would I would consider doing uh, maybe maybe IVF with some uh, genetic testing before moving to egg donation, but it's hard to know with the amount of information that I've got. Oh, of course, that's totally understandable. But thank you so much for that recommendation mm -hmm. as well. And next question is ready. I am forty eight and I'm single. Do you think I will need egg donation? Hi, Tani. Um, yeah, I think so. I think uh, egg donation or embryo donation would be the best option for you. Um, at 48, as I mentioned to the patient who was 46 a little bit uh, earlier, it's just incredibly rare to fall pregnant uh, naturally at 40, 48. It used to happen generations ago when women had like 15 children and, you know, a little last one appeared when they were in their mid to late 40s. But nowadays it hardly ever happens. Uh, life just isn't isn't that way anymore and you're single as well so uh, falling pregnant naturally would be would be maybe a bit harder um so i think egg donation but do consider embryo donation embryo donation is a is a cheaper option and um you don't you you're going to need an egg donor and you're probably going to need a sperm donor because you're single so an embryo is already created we would do a matching of your racial type to whatever you are and um, and that's usually a really nice option and it's a, an easier treatment to do as well okay thanks for your question Tony excellent thank you so much and of course there's a thank you also from and Tani and of course from the previous patient uh, thank you so much. That is really helpful. Thank you as well. Um, next question is also right here regarding Institute Marquez. What is your availability of Asian, Indian, Pakistani and or Arab donors? Thank you, Nassim, for your question. That's um, something uh, that's very important for patients. Um, I have to say in Spain, we don't have many Indian or Pakistani donors. We have had a few over the years, but they're f they are few and far between. We do, however, get an awful lot of people of Indian and Pakistani origin coming, particularly from the UK, for treatment. And when we explain to them that we don't have a lot of donors of their racial origin, we offer them um, a Mediterranean donor, um, with, you know, dark hair, dark eyes, olive skin. And for many of them, that is acceptable. Not all of them, but for many of them, that is acceptable. Um, and it's the same for Arab donors. We do have a few Arab donors um, on our books, as far as I recall, but not very many. So again, it's a question of looking at the recipient's characteristics and seeing whether um, maybe a Caucasian or Mediterranean donor would be acceptable to them. But this is a conversation that we have with the patients based on what is available at the time that they come to us. And sometimes they're okay with it and sometimes they're not. Um, if you're really, really keen to have a donor of your own origin, so let's say you're Indian, uh, maybe even, I don't know, maybe your UK-based second, third in, uh, generation Indian, so you're English, but you might be able to go back to India to get an Indian donor. Uh, India, it does offer egg donation, for example. Um, 
but only will, will only treat people who have an Indian passport, for example. So look around. Uh, if what I'm suggesting is not acceptable to you, then there may be other options in India itself or Pakistan. It's, I don't think Pakistan, but maybe India. Um, or maybe the United States. The United States has a lot of uh, donors. There are a lot of egg donors over there. Egg donation is much more expensive in the US than it is in Europe generally, but they may have uh, a wide range of donors um, of the type that you're particularly seeking. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. And actually, there is a follow-up, okay, from the same mm -hmm. patient. So let me show you straight away this one. So I am aware that the donation process is anonymous in Spain, but as the patient, are you able to define any preferences of donor? Uh, so, so it's anonymous uh, in Spain and we choose the donor for you based on your physical characteristics, your racial group, your psychological parameters, your temperament, your blood groups. And so to that extent, we choose for you. You can't uh, really, as a patient, it, you can express your preferences, but we can't always um, guarantee them. So, for example, I get... Uh, patients who might say to me, well, you know, me and my, my husband and I, we have both have a PhD. We're really highly educated people. We'd really, really like to have a, a, a donor who is a university student. And I say to them, well, 50% of our donors are university students, but that's not something I can guarantee. So I make a note of it and I say, if possible, um, the patient would like a university student as a donor, um, but they understand that this is not something I can guarantee. So we note down your preferences, but there are certain things that we can't we can't guarantee. Um, so that's that's what we do when a patient, you know, preferences have to be also reasonable. So asking to have someone who is a university student seems quite reasonable if you are both university uh, educated or something like that but i had a patient that once asked me for a donor with high cheekbones because she had high cheekbones and you know that's the kind of thing that we can't deal with we can't go with that kind of detail we're going to try and find the best donor for you a healthy woman who matches you according to your hair color eye color skin color race and blood group and psychological parameters but we can't cope with uh, with those kind of uh, preferences so it depends on your preferences we'll take a note of, we'll take a note of them if we can though. thank you for your question and amazing thank you so much for that thorough answer once again and there's a thank you from the patient for you thank you victoria your answer is really helpful couldn't agree more <laughs> and of course there are like three questions left so we will be slowly finishing okay so if you have any questions that you haven't uh, asked yet it is your time to do so go ahead and type those in and let's have a look at the next question that we have is it necessary to have a mammogram before starting donor egg treatment um, thank you, Mundef. It depends. Um, it depends on your history and it depends on your age. So um, we would often recommend that women over the age of 45 might, excuse me, have a mammogram before they start. Um, alternatively, women who might have a strong family history of, uh, well, I, well, family history in particular of breast cancer or something like that. So yes, it's something that's quite often requested. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Next question is right here. Is your clinic in Dublin as efficient as that in Spain? Of course. <laughs> of course. Thank you for your question. Yes. Um, the centre in Dublin is the same. Um, the staff, we've got two doctors over there at the moment. They're both Spanish and they've been with us they've trained with us in barcelona before they went over there um and it's true with the, the with the embryologists as well they've all been trained in our centers center in spain before they went over to dublin um so in in ireland i believe the admin staff 
are Irish and that helps with communication, but everything else is kind of Spanish run and according to the Spanish lines as dictated by the owners of the Institute, Marques and the directors. So yeah, it should be as efficient as the Spanish clinic. Thank you for your question. All right, that sounds uh, definitely reassuring. Thank you so much for this. And of course, there's a thank you here as well. And uh, next question is up. Are there any do's and don'ts after the Ember transfer to help implantation? Um, well, people have looked at that over the years. There's quite a lot of research. And essentially, the summary is um, have a normal life. Just do normal things. If we felt that, you know, standing on your head for two weeks after the embryo transfer would help with implantation we tell you to do it and if they're not we don't say anything it's because there's nothing that's been shown to be helpful so we would say after embryo transfer just carry on with your normal life um try not to um probably try not to lie down too much just just carry on with normal life go to work go to walk around you can do sport you as long as you remember to take your medication, you just need to carry on. Uh, the only exception to that would be if you have a really, really hard job, physically hard job, then maybe you could ask to have a few days off or something. Um, but generally, carry on with your normal life and try to think of something else because it's really hard to get through those sort of 10 days um and uh, just wondering whether it's worked or it hasn't worked so distract yourself go to the cinema well not now obviously people can't at the moment but that kind of thing keep yourself active uh see friends that kind of thing even if it's just on zoom all right thank you so much for that as well and um you've kind of mentioned uh already oh sorry there's a great advice from the patient for you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, you have mentioned this, okay, but if you could just uh, clarify. So do you do embryo adoption to help patients? Uh, to help patients or hepatitis B patients? Um, I think it might be hepatitis B. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We treat patients with hepatitis B. We treat patients with hepatitis C, although you don't see them very often, and HIV. We can we can help people with all all the transmissible illnesses. Depends on which partner it is, what we do, um, um, and things like that. But we have protocols to be able to help everyone. Yeah. All right, that's wonderful to hear indeed. All right, next question is a bit of a longer one. So um, for egg donation, what drugs do you give your female receiver to take? Also, is the administration of the medical general or specific? If specific, how do you determine what the medication will be like and the dose of the protocol? Mm. So, okay. I mean, the dose to receive. Okay, so um, actually for egg donation, there is a very standard protocol that we start by using in everyone who if if you've never done egg donation before that's where you would start so it's usually a, a contraceptive pill to synchronize with the donor and then you come off that at the same time as the donor you have your period and would start estradiol at that stage so you and the donor are having your periods at the same time she's starting the IVF medication so injections but you're with estradiol it used to always be patch form, but nowadays it's quite difficult to get hold of patches, so it's oral form. After a week of patches, you have a scan in the country in which you live. You send us that result, and then we wait for the donor to be ready. When she's ready, we fertilize the eggs and organize the embryo transfer, usually five days later if you're doing a blastocyst transfer. And once we know when the transfer is going to occur, we'll confirm when to start progesterone into the vagina, so that's usually vaginal pessaries. And after transfer, you'd continue with both the oral estradiol and the vaginal pessaries uh, until the pregnancy test. And if that's positive, then you increase the doses and keep going for another eight weeks after that. So that's the standard protocol. Very occasionally you get people who don't respond well to that stimulation, to that protocol, and then you have to sort of jiggle it around a bit and try something different. Um, uh, but that works for the great majority of people to try and get them ready uh, for egg donation. Thanks for your question, Idioma. 
Thank you so much as well. And once again, another question is up. I have had day three tests in October to see how the results were, were in comparison to day three results in February. My prolactin has increased to 1,247. I recently had a failed implantation IVF cycle in September. Could this treatment have caused this increase? Is this level an issue if we wish to a future round? Secondly, you mentioned supplements. Which ones do you recommend? Okay, Karen, thanks for your question. Um, so your prolactin has increased. I don't recall um, if you're in the UK. That's a high, very, very high level if you're in Spain, and it's a relatively high level if you're in the UK because um, we use different ranges. And... I don't know if that would have been a cause of your implantation failure. I don't think it would have been the implantation failure that made your prolactin go up. Um, so in my opinion, yes, it is something to have a look at. Uh, it is something to investigate further. Um, and it's something that can be treated to bring the prolactin level down um, if you wanted to have another treatment. Um, and then with regard to the supplements, in terms of, I can't remember which supplements, at which, which point I mentioned it, supplements, if you're doing egg donation, the main supplement would be um, folic acid, simple folic acid, uh, 400 micrograms a day orally if you're just a normal person, as it were, and five milligrams a day if you're somebody who has some um, other illnesses, maybe diabetes or epilepsy, or you take certain types of medication. Um, but that's the main supplement we would recommend. A lot of people who live in the Northern Hemisphere are missing um, a bit of vitamin D, and you have better success rates if your vitamin D replete. So if you think you might be lacking in vitamin D, then taking that supplement can be helpful. Um, and today we weren't really talking about IVF, so I think those are the main supplements we might be you, you might be thinking of. Thanks for your question. Of course, thank you so much. And actually, there is a follow up. Okay, so let me just try to wait show you that could I, could it have been the IVF medication that contributed to such high prolactin level? Um, the IVF medication may make the prolactin go up a bit, but I don't think it usually makes such a high prolactin level. Um, so I would suggest that that's something to monitor and check to see what it's doing over the next few months um, and see if, if you need to have it investigated further. Thank you for your question. And thank you once again. And of course, there's a thanks from Karen for you, indeed. Um, okay, something that uh, shows up quite often. Uh, this is the question in regards to DHEA. Would you recommend it? Uh, Yuri, that's a question, I think, really more for IVF with your own eggs. Um, yeah. So in IVF, it can be considered. We don't use it here, but it can be considered for egg donation. You don't need it. It's not, it's not, you use DHEA to try and improve the quality of your own eggs. And when you're using egg donation, you don't need DHEA anymore for that reason. Thank you. For your Understood. Thank you as well for that. And there are like three, sorry, two questions uh, in one. Okay, so let me show you. Um, so at this COVID moment, do I need to test, uh, to do tests for COVID before entering the hospital? If I find a partner, do you still recommend better embryo than egg donation? Uh, I'm 30, uh, 48, sorry. Okay, so um, Currently, uh, yes, COVID is the huge problem. We all know it is. Um, but we ourselves are not re requesting a COVID test for patients before they come and see us. Um, the only thing we do is test their temperature on arrival at the center. And then 
um, obviously we will turn them away if they have a temperature and send them away to have a blood test. But um, otherwise we wouldn't test them, uh, uh, request a blood test before they come. And then obviously we follow all the protocols to keeping people separate and pre protecting staff and protecting the patients. Um, yes, if you, you're 48 and you do find a partner, that would be nice. Um, but uh, in that case, if you find a partner, then an egg donation would be would probably be what you want as a couple. Because when someone is in a, a couple, usually they they like the idea of keeping the link, the genetic link, with at least one person. Um, so if you can if you can keep the link through the sperm, um, that that would be lovely. But if you don't find a partner, then an embryo donation is is a very nice option. I think. Thank you for your question, Tammy. Thank you once more for that. Um, okay, let's have a look. Next question is, so folic acid, what do you advise? 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams? What is the total cost to undergo egg donation at your clinic? I love the musical gig you use at your clinic. Really cool. <laughs> um, well, folic acid, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on, on you. Um, actually, it's usually a lower dose of uh, for folic acid for most people um, 400 micrograms a day that's mcg and then you can go up to five or or even ten if you've got other other things so as i mentioned earlier diabetes epilepsy certain types of medication or you've had a problem in a previous pregnancy with a a baby being formed incorrectly and um, and it's been advised that you take higher doses of folic acid. But generally, um, most people will still take the lower dose. You, the lower dose can be bought over the counter, whereas the higher dose you need a prescription for. Um, the total cost of egg donation, well, it depends on what you need. Um, uh in terms of additional things bits and bobs but the basic cost for egg donation is around 6600 euros with us and then you need to add to that um the medication for the donor which is about 1500 and then about 500 euros for using the embryoscope and about 500 euros to have a day five transfer. So in general, the egg donation can cost between eight and 9,000 euros um, for the fresh transfer. Um, there is a more expensive option. If that wasn't expensive enough, there is a more expensive option. Um, and that's the refunding scheme. And that's where you pay 20, 4,400 euros, so a large amount of money. But for that, you get a guarantee of a live birth now. Um, uh, if you, uh, and you get a chance to do three cycles of egg donation. So if you don't achieve your live birth, then they would return 70% of your original sum. So 16 to 17,000 euros back. It's up to you. You can. These are details that you can discuss with your doctor if you decide to go ahead with that uh, treatment. All right. Okay, okay. okay that's Understood. fine. Thank you so much for that. And of course, uh, again, there are like two questions, and I believe we will be finishing. And I just want to mention that, of course, remember that if you would like to get some more details from Dr. Walker or and her team. You can also use the link that uh, I will send in a second. And of course, that way you will be able to get in touch with whole team. And I'm sure they will be more than happy to assist you. And mm -hmm. the next question is, can you please recommend any supplements to help build endometrium lining? Mm. So, um, ah, right. Uh, endometrial lining, uh, for most people, will just respond with estradiol. Um, it's quite rare that you need anything else. Occasionally, you can some sometimes some people don't respond very well to estradiol, and in that if that happens, then occasionally just a natural cycle will help build up the endometrial lining better. And finally, very rarely we would use IVF medication just to make the endometrium grow a bit. Um, so those are sort of medications that we would use to make the endometrial lining grow. 
we don't generally recommend supplements like as in like nutritional supplements to try and help build up the new the endometrium um maybe that's a lack of knowledge on my behalf um but it's not something i generally look at very much i think uh, you can rec you can try uh, some patients that do vitamins e and c i think it was um because that those are thought to improve the blood flow to the uterus um tocopherol as well but generally not there's not so much that's thought to act solely on the endometrium and help with the endometrial growth thanks for your question mandev all right excellent thank you once more for that and the it seems that that will be our final question so what is the importance of matching same blood group with a donor and the receiving Okay, so that's that's an interesting question. Thank you, Dioma. Um, it's uh, basically it's not important medically. It's it doesn't really matter if we match the blood groups, but we match them because a lot of couples who come to us for egg donation have not yet thought about whether they would or wouldn't tell any child created that they've been made using egg donation. So if you think that you would not tell the child or you don't net yet know what you would do, then it's better to match because what you don't want is for a child to sort of wander home age 15 saying, you know, mom, I'm blood group B and what are you and mum's O and dad's O because then you have to have a conversation that you weren't necessarily prepared to have with your child um, and and the child finds out in a rather unpleasant way that they've been created from egg donation. So um, it's, it's to try, we match the blood groups if you are certain you do not want to tell the child or you don't yet know what you're going to do with regard to telling the child. If you are absolutely certain that when the time comes, you will tell your child that they have been created from egg donation, then you don't need to match the blood groups. As I say, the the medically, it doesn't matter. Thank you for your question. I hope that's clear. Thank you so much. Definitely, that was helpful. So thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. We will be finishing for tonight. and uh, But as I mentioned, you can always get in touch with Dr. Walker and her team. And I am definitely sure they will be more than happy to assist you with any questions that you will have. And of course, um, well, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you so much for your time, for your answers. And as you can see, there are plenty of comments coming up. Your way right here from all the patients and everyone found it very very interesting as well so thank you thank you so much and well my only question to you is uh, is there anything else you would like to add no no it's been uh, a pleasure thank you uh, for everyone for listening and thank you caroline for your evening that you've given to us and uh, if anyone has any other questions please do send them and we'll get back to you Thanks so much. And this is definitely an interesting session that we got. So thank you so much. And well, there are plenty of those comments coming up. So uh, thank you also for your time, you know, for spending this uh, other evening with us. And of course, for uh, I do hope it has been very, very useful for you. So thank you. And I just want to mention once again that it has been recorded. It will be available on our site, myivfanswers.com. It will be available, available tomorrow. And of course, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, that way you will know that the video has been uploaded and of course you can find all the previous sessions on our youtube channel and our website as well i can only encourage you to join us tomorrow we will be having two webinars tomorrow so you can join us at 5 p.m uk time and then at 8 p.m uk time we will be back here and once again thank you so much dr walker for being with us tonight it's been definitely interesting and it has been a pleasure to have you with us as well it's definitely a pleasure to to have you and well i just hope we will be able to do another webinar well, soon. we'll see thank you very much bye thank bye -bye. you so much as well thank you take care everyone bye, bye.